I'm Greg Powell, and this is Investors Insights. You're listening to Investors Insights with President and CEO Greg Powell and the Portfolio Strategy Team at Five Plan Partners, Ashley Page and Franklin Bradford. Hey, thanks for joining me today. I am very excited about the interview that I uh, have today uh, with Rob Syke. Rob is a professional agrologist and also CEO and founder of the AgriTrend Group. Uh, AgriTrend has been nominated as one of Canada's 2012 top 50 best managed companies, recognized by Venture Magazine as one of Alberta's 2013 top 25 most innovative organizations. And as for Rob, he's involved in the development of many new business processes and concepts, which those of you that have watched before know I've thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. He's a passionate keynote speaker addressing audiences on the importance of modern agriculture. He's author of the Agriculture Manifesto, uh, highly recommended it is 10 key drivers that will shape agriculture in the next decade. In 2006, he was recognized as Distinguished Agrologist of the Year by the Alberta Institute of Agrology, and he is also passionate about pursuing business opportunities in the agricultural sector. So with that said, I want to just introduce you to Rob Syke. Rob, uh, how's life in Canada these days? Uh, great, Greg. We've got uh, hot weather here. The stampede is on in Calgary. We're dealing with hailstorms that uh, unfortunately took out a couple of my farms last night. And we're dealing with floods. So pretty much normal for farming. Wow, okay. All right. Well, we've got a, a lot of folks that are interested in your topic. The world is changing rapidly, and, and in agriculture, it's especially changing. And you've been one of the leaders cutting edge to, to keep, keep ahead of the trends. And so I've got a few questions I would like to ask you. Uh, and just let's just brainstorm, have dialogue here. Sure. So and uh, hopefully our viewers will, uh, and the listeners on the, the podcast, as well as the viewers on the vlog, will... Uh, get some great ideas and takeaways. I always do every time I'm with you. So let me start off by just saying for our investors who are not in agriculture, just tell us why it's important to follow the changes in this industry. Well, macroeconomically, we have uh, up to 9 billion people by 2050. There are only about six or seven regions around the world that actually produce more food than they consume. Uh, North America, Canada, the United States are uh, those regions. So actually, the U.S. is not. Canada is one of the regions. The U.S. Right. actually will continue to consume more food than it produces. Uh, but uh, the, the key driver here is everyday people need to eat. The quality of uh, living is getting better around the world. People are wanting to consume a varied life, a uh, more varied diet. And so it's putting uh, enhanced opportunity uh, in front of culture. And I think that there is opportunity for investors to play in agriculture, and maybe not in the in the way that you would just think about uh, traditional land holdings. But there are a lot of technology and other plays coming into the sector right now. Uh, it's a very fast-moving sector right now, Greg. Yeah, very much so, and that that ties into that. I mean, it appears the rate of change in agriculture is increasing. Can you mm. just explain why that's happening? Well, I think we're in a current. We're, we're floating along in a big river, a technology river, and as the speed of computers gets to 10 to the 16th power and a and $1,000 laptop starts to calculate at the same speed of the human brain, uh, the amount of data we're going to collect is going to increase exponentially. The ability to take all that data, synthesize it, and do something with it is, a, is going to hit all of us in society. It doesn't matter uh, what the viewer sector is today, whatever that he or she is living in today, they're involved in this current, and agriculture is not exempt. In fact, I would argue that agriculture is being swept along very quickly in this, right. uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to see a proliferation of information, and uh, you know, uh, there, there are some big moves being made in the technology sector of agriculture right now today, and some billion dollar deals are coming down fairly regularly. Right. Well, when you say agriculture, a lot of times to the average consumer, they're thinking about when I go to the grocery store, what's there for me to, to be able to buy, to cons consume and eat. And so I think a lot of people have an impression of agriculture as being a bit slow on the uptake on technology. And you have voiced that that's not accurate. And can you just give us some examples of that? 
Just some sure. specific things. Sure. Picture, uh, picture a corn farmer in uh, Iowa. He's okay. got a maybe a 40-foot corn planter. It's being run by and guided by GPS and auto steer. It's down to a sub-inch accuracy. So as he's going up and down his field, that corn planter is within one inch. He turns it at the end, and it plants in absolutely straight straight rows. And your viewers would see this as they drive up and down the highways. Inside the cab of that tractor are a series of computers that are controlling the variable rate application of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and even micronutrients. And also now, we could be varying the amount of seed that's going on based on topography or varieties based on microclimate inside that field. So this is all happening in real time up and down that field. And while that's happening, uh, the farmer is sitting in that cab uh, bored to death because everything is programmed and he is surfing the internet, uh, watching videos, maybe communicating with people, uh, tweeting, which farmers are incredible at. Really? And if you want to have some fun, all you have to do is go hashtag plant 14 or hashtag harvest 14 or hashtag harvest 15 and you can follow the progress of the harvest all across the world wow. just by putting in hashtag yeah. harvest 15 real time it's just amazing that's unreal that is yeah well uh many people worry about our ability to feed the planet uh do you worry about that and and the reason i'm asking that question you've got you probably have those out there that don't embrace some of the technological advances and others who do no, I, I, yes and no, Greg. I, I don't worry about our ability in, in terms of capacity to feed the world. I travel extensively. I, I've been, I just got back a little while ago from Kenya. I spent some time just recently in Brazil and Argentina. I've been in Australia, New Zealand, Kazakhstan, Russia. I just got back from London, England. I travel all over Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So as I travel around, I, I watch farmers' ability to embrace technology, right. and the drivers are there. In, in other words, if there's an economic incentive, farmers adopt technology and make it run real, real fast. I believe wholeheartedly that we're able to utilize our technology to feed 9 billion people and feed them very, very well and right. feed them a really good diet. The, the concern I have is that uh, we have a disconnect between the large urban centers and, and real agriculture in, in, the, in the rural area. And people in Se Seattle have no concept of how food is really grown. I just got back from Seattle, and there's a big push on for local grown Seattle food. Well, that's fine, but you can't feed the city on Seattle based on this <laughs> local board point. mentality. It's not gonna work. So my concern, Greg, in this whole thing is there are a lot of non-science and anti-science, and I call right. it the nonsense movement. I mean, GMO is just a classic example. If you pull back the rhetoric and stop listening to the rhetoric about GMO and really get into... And explain the GMO. Explain GMO. When genetically you're... modified organ, uh, organisms. Genetically. So you've okay. got genetically modification or bioengineering or genetic engineering. Okay, talk about that. that things in agriculture, phenomenal things, to reduce tillage, to reduce pesticide load, contrary to what you would see if you Googled GMO in, uh, on the internet. But this technology and what, what's going on, Greg, what concerns me is that people that are not well informed and agriculture only represents less than 2% of the population in the, in the United States of America, wow. those people don't have a voice and yet you've got people marching and, and protesting and all this stuff with no real clue about what's going on in the countryside. Right. And what, what results is you get panic policy being made. Okay. Panic policy is very dangerous. It's policy not based on science. So my answer to your question is, can we feed 9 billion people? Absolutely. The bigger question is, will, be, will we be allowed to? And that's... That's really the bigger question. Well, and the, okay, and, and on that bigger question, then what I'm hearing, you're saying that's probably our biggest danger facing agriculture yeah, today. It's the biggest danger facing agriculture, and what it's going to take is it's going to take education for people to realize, you know, uh, there are a lot of really, really great scientists and, and, and people working and, and companies working in this industry. Do you really believe 
that the folks at Monsanto in St. Louis wake up every morning <laughs> to diabolically, systematically poison the planet Earth yeah. by yeah. destroying the very customer base that they make a living on. Come on, let's have <laughs> a little rationality here. Right. And, uh, and I could go on. There's a lot of great science happening. And you don't have to go to big corporations, but I could... I could throw out the Danforth Center at a St. Louis example that's uh, producing a, a biotech cassava that will fight the virus and cassava feeds the poorest people on the planet. Uh, bio bananas fortified and, and, and golden rice that's been held up by Greenpeace large since 2004, this bio fortified uh, with beta carotene which would prevent millions of children from going blind every year and that sits on the shelf since 2014. Uh, not making it to the marketplace because of panic protests and and panic policy. Yeah. Well, how do how do we overcome that? How how do we, in terms of our voice? But that's a uh, and, and let me say this: when I'm looking at trends in the economy, that would be a trend I would look at as a danger. I'm then also going to be looking for for a trend as to what's the biggest opportunity. It sounds like one of the biggest opportunities may be educating the the general public that hey. You know, you you need to support this to, to move forward on the genetic uh, modified as well as other technologies being used. Well, that and, and that's a that's an interesting thing is I mean, there's a fusing here of technologies. You take a good organic uh, grower out there that that figures out how to work uh, uh, and and make better use of biological systems and soils. We can use some of that knowledge in large co conventional agriculture. At the same time, you could take the genetic engineering that's going on in crops and, and put that into the organic food production. Like, mm -hmm. When did the organic food production movement become the anti-GMO movement? It doesn't make any sense. Right. Uh, organic producers want to use less pesticides, less synthetic fertilizers. There's not a farmer on the planet that wakes up in the morning and says, yay, I get to spray on another 25 <laughs> bucks an acre of pesticide. It doesn't make any sense. Right. And yet if we could use the technology, we could breed crops that would be more efficient at fighting, for example, late blight in potatoes instead of spraying fungicides on seven to 16 times. We could have a genetically engineered potato that would fight late blight, and that exists today. So education is the key component to this, and uh, part of that is, is this interview with you today, you know? Yeah, sure, and that's one reason I wanted to do it, because on yeah. multiple levels, as people are looking at the economy, as they're looking at agriculture, as they're looking at our society, not only here in the United States and Canada, but globally, I think your topic is going to be a major topic going forward. Uh, and I think you're ahead of the curve, and I think people need to understand that. So well, we're, gonna uh, produce, you know, uh, yeah, we're gonna produce a documentary next year. Uh, it's gonna be entitled No GMO, which is K-N-O-W, and it's gonna be uh, a worldwide documentary. So we're working on raising the funds right now for that. So an educational documentary with vignettes. So that's where we're gonna go, yeah. That's fantastic. So, yeah. well, I mean, it, it, in terms of, our brainstorming here. Is there any other points that you want to leave people with? I knew, I know they need to, to get your book, which I want to display here in just a minute. And then also from the standpoint, any other information that they can, can download or, or receive from you? And how do they well, get in touch with you to speak for your? Well, you know, if, they're, if they're interested in, uh, in in following what's going on in the agriculture sector from a science based, I, I do produce a journal. And this journal right here is called the Ag Advanced Journal, and we produce it on a quarterly basis. It's about 68 pages, and it's a cross between Harvard Business Review and Popular Science for Agriculture, and it's free. So you go online to agadvanced.com, and you register there, and we'll send it to you. And okay. it's a very, very cool publication. Uh, and uh, even if you're not involved in agriculture, the, the latest issue has got a, has got a fantastic uh, section on, uh, on drone technology and how farmers are using drones. And you wouldn't think that uh, ag policy would care about aerospace, but right now in Canada and the US, uh, the, uh, the, bureau the bureaucracy and the, uh, uh, the, light the, the regulators are struggling with how to deal with culture of people like myself yeah. uh, flying yeah. drones over crops because it falls outside the jurisdictions of a lot of things. Well, within the jurisdiction, but outside the current rules. Okay. So we're grappling with uh, with drone technology in agriculture right now, which is a tremendous thing. And then sensor technology, which is 
is booming. There are going to be lots and lots of investment opportunities for uh, your uh, uh, your listeners in agriculture. Data plays, biotech plays, uh, sensor plays, robotic plays, artificial intelligence plays. And the more they uh, understand that agriculture is not behind, but rather on the leading edge in terms of adopting these technologies, 3D printing, all of this stuff is hitting fast and hard yeah. and uh, it's going to require a lot of capital to uh, to take advantage of the opportunities. That's great. I greatly appreciate you doing the interview with me and I'm going to encourage everybody to get your agriculture manifesto. Uh, also sure. another great read uh, that will just get them up to speed in regards to this, uh, this interview. Yep. So sure. thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you soon and uh, having you speak to some groups. More information at FIGrandPartners.com. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC.